Hello and welcome to the Vantage Seminar. Uh, today we're continuing our series of talks on the Teresa cycle and algebraic cycles. And we're very happy to have uh, Richard Hain, who will be speaking today on what can one say about the loci where the normal function of the Teresa cycle is constant. And is it all right for us to record this talk? Uh, yes, it is. Wonderful. And please ask questions as we go. Um, so please go ahead. Okay, well, thank you for asking me to give this talk. Um, I'm very happy to give it. And so um, I had not thought about the Teresa cycle for a long time until Xu Wu Zhou asked, Zhang asked me about the rank of the normal function. But when I was doing that, I actually came across some interesting stuff or I hope it's interesting, regarding the loci where the normal function of the Teresa cycle or the Gross-Schoen cycle, if you like, is torsion. So um, a lot of people have been thinking about this recently. So I list some here, Baville, Schoen, uh, Chu and Zhang and uh, Ladavir and Lagash Didman. So they're mainly concerned with uh, the cycle mod algebraic equivalence. And uh, because I don't do that kind of mathematics, I want to talk about where the normal function is torsion. So that's a uh, an easier question, but it's related to the first, because if the cycle is torsion mod algebraic equivalence, the normal function will vanish or be torsion. So my main goal is to introduce some new global tools and techniques for understanding where the normal function is taught, normal functions in general are torsion, but in particular, the normal function of the Teresa cycle. And for students and non-experts, this could be tough because I've got to explain these new ideas and they may involve unfamiliar ideas, but hang in there. There should be, if you get lost at a certain point, there should be re-entry points where you can pick it up. Also feel free to ask questions. Um, all right. So let me quickly go through the setup, but every other talk so far is given the setup. So this should not be new and I'm going to go quickly. So I have more time to go through the more novel material. But anyway, C will be a smooth projective curve. I'll take it to have genus at least two. But since every genus two curve is hyperelliptic, generally G will be three or more. And the ground field, except at the very end, will be the complex numbers. And so if you have a divisor of degree one, for example, a point, you can embed, use it to embed the curve in its Jacobian in the standard way. And the image of that map is an algebraic cycle that I'll denote C sub X, where X is the divisor of degree one. And you can use the involution of the Jacobian to obtain another algebraic one cycle in the Jacobian. They're, they're homologous, so their difference is homologous to zero. And that's the Teresa cycle. And you may ask what happens if I use a different point um, Instead of X, well, the two cycles will be algebraically equivalent because all those different cycles, Z, C, X are parameterized by the curve. So they're in the same algebraic family. So how do you detect a homologically trivial cycle? Well, there's a method that goes back to Griffiths and I'll explain it in a slightly more modern way. So if you have a cycle and I'll take it to be dimension D, not co-dimension D, on a smooth projective variety, and I'll assume it's zero in homology, you obtain an extension of the trivial Hodge structure of type zero, zero by the this odd com homology group of the ambient space, and you twist it by minus D. And don't worry about the twist. You, If you have an odd dimensional hot structure, you can always twist it so it has weight minus one. So this twist has weight minus one. So it's an extension of something of weight zero by something of weight minus one. And you can do the same thing with L-adic coefficients. 
in the category of Galois modules. And here's the construction. You just look at the long exact sequence of the pair Y and the support of Z. That's the top row of the diagram below. And you pull it back along the class map, which takes Z into H2D, the top dimensional homology of the support of Z. And you get the extension at the bottom. It's exact on the right because Z is homologous to zero. And it's exact on the left because H2D plus one of the support of Z is zero because Z has got real dimension 2D. So you get this extension. And now we want to understand what the group of extensions in the category of mixed Hodge structures is of Z by a Hodge structure of negative weight. And it's a standard thing that it's going to be the complexification of V mod um, the integral lattice in V plus half the Hodge filtration. So if you have a Hodge structure of weight minus one, you can write it as F0 plus F0 bar. Everything either has at least zero DZs or at least zero DZ bars and can't have both. And so this tells you that the map, if you include VR, the, the real part of, you know, V tensored with R, into VC mod F0, it's actually an R linear isomorphism. And this tells you that the Jacobian of the, the this intermediate Jacobian, J of V of the Hodge structure, is actually the real torus VR mod VZ, which is compact. So J of V is a complex, compact torus, typically not algebraic. So this is the group of extensions. J of V is the group of extensions. If you have a homologically trivial cycle, it gives you a point in there by the, slide, the one slide before the last slide. And this point depends only on the rational equivalence class of the cycle. So this tells you that the Chiresa cycle determines a point in the Jacobian of H lower three of the Jacobian. And I'll write this as J of lambda three H. So H three of the Jacobian is the third exterior power of H one, and I'll denote H one by H. And I should say here, I've got a little footnote there, just to avoid cumbersome notation, I'll always twist these so they have weight minus one. So H lower three has weight minus three, you just twist it so it's got weight minus one. All right, so the, since we only care about this cycle mod algebraic equivalence, um, we need to, it'd be nice to get rid of the base point dependent. And the way you do this is you do the following construction. So if you take a symplectic basis of H1 of the curve, so this is with respect to the intersection pairing or the dual of the cup product, you um, obtain an element of the second exterior power, which I'll call theta. And so the exterior algebra on the, yeah, the, you have an exterior algebra on H and theta is an element of degree two. So multiplying it gives you a, by it gives you a map from H into the third exterior power. And it's a morphism of Hodge structures. And so it induces an inclusion of the Jacobian of the curve into the Jacobian of H3 of the, the Jacobian. And we have the result of Pulte, who proved this back in the 1980s, that said if you take two different devices of degree one, then the difference between the two points, that you, the points of the Chiresa cycle of Cx and Cy inside the Jacobian of the third exterior power really lies in the Jacobian and it's just twice the difference x minus y, the divisor class of x minus y. So this is not surprising. And so what we're going to do here is we set lambda 3 0 equal to the quotient of the full exterior, third exterior power by the image of theta. So this is really the primitive intermediate Jacobian of the Jacobian, sorry, the primitive H3 of the Jacobian. And so the point you get in, so the image of 
the point in the intermediate Jacobian corresponding to CX in the intermediate Jacobian of this guy does not depend on X, right? Because we've modded out the Jacobian of H3 by the Jacobian of the curve. So we've modded out by the indeterminacies. The, all right, so I'm going to denote this point in the primitive intermediate J Jacobian by new C. And, um, okay, so now we want to do this construction in family. So Griffiths did this and used variational methods to prove various results about algebraic cycles. So we're going to do the same. Um, so let's suppose we have a family of smooth projective varieties. Sorry, a smooth projective morsel. Morphism. So all the fibers are smooth and projective. And suppose we have a, an algebraic cycle in Y whose restriction to each fiber is homologically trivial and has dimension D in co-dimension E. So there's the picture. And um, what you can do here is we're going to take the local system uh, uh, whose fiber is, um, well, I wrote it down in fancy language, in concrete terms, the fiber is a, this odd dimensional homology group of the fiber twisted by minus D. So it's twisted, so it has weight minus one. And so we have a bundle of intermediate Jacobians over X, which I'll call J of V. It has fiber, the intermediate Jacobian of, let's see, go back here. V is this local system. It has fiber H2D plus one Y of X twisted over X. And that thing in the bottom row is what I'm calling VX. So you take the Jacobian of that, you get the um, class of that homologically trivial cycle ZX in the intermediate Jacobian of that fiber. So it gives you a section. And such a section is an example of a normal function and they have many non-trivial properties, but one is that they're holomorphic. And um, the ones that arise from geometry have even more properties that are not easy to write down here. And they're called admissible normal functions and normal functions of homologically trivial, families of homologically trivial cycles are um, admissible. But I wouldn't focus on that, but we will need it at the very end. Okay, so in the case of the Teresa cycle, the map from uh, Y to X is just the universal Jacobian over the moduli space, or maybe we should say moduli stack of curves, the smooth projective curves of genus two. And for it to make any sense at all, we've got to do we take G to be at least two, sorry, at least three. If G were two, the primitive intermediate Jacobian is zero. So we there's nothing interesting there. So we have the Teresa normal function over MG. It's a section of the bun bundle of intermediate Jacobians of the primitive part of H3 of the Jacobian. And on the fiber, it's just the construction on the fiber over the moduli point of C, it's just the construction we gave before. Okay, so is that all clear? I think this has been in maybe in different language in other talks. All right, so um, it's easy to see that this vanishes on the hyperelliptic locus, and that's because if C is hyperelliptic, we can choose X to be a um, Lyastras point, and in that case, the cycle itself actually vanishes. All right, so I want to introduce some terminology that's not too surprising. So I'm going to call, so we're going to start with a variation of hot structure of weight minus one over our base. And we're going to, just for simplicity, we're going to assume that the integral lattice, the underlying Z local system, is torsion free. And that's true in our case of the Teresa cycle. And we're going to call a section 
of j of v over x constant if it's a constant section of the constant subfamily. So what's the constant subfamily? You have a local system v, and you can ask, what are the invariant sections invariant on the monodromy? And that's the h0 of x v. And that will be a constant variation of Hodge structures. And you can take that, the intermediate Jacobian of that constant Hodge structure, and you get a constant family of intermediate Jacobians. And so I'm going to say a section over X is constant if it's a constant section of the this constant subfamily. You, you can have... Um, normal function sections of a constant family of intermediate Jacobians, but I'm not allowing that. It has to be a constant section of a constant subfamily. And a section is torsion if a positive multiple of it vanishes. That's obvious. And a section is torsion mod constants if a positive multiple of it is constant. Okay, and you may wonder why I've defined constant sections, and this is because you may, it's possible you restrict to a sublocus in moduli where the, the primitive part of H3 of the Jacobians, the local system of primitive part of H3 of the Jacobians has a constant factor. We need to consider that. All right, so there is a basic theorem due to Brosnan and Perlstein, Kato, Asui, and somebody else, and uh, Schnell, and it states that the locus where a normal function is torsion, or even torsion mod constants, is an algebraic subvariety of the base. So a priori, it's only an analytic subvariety, but and in fact turns out to be they, the loci of where the norm, a normal function is uh, torsion mod constants is always an algebraic subvariety of X. So there are two basic questions. So the first is what can we say about the locus of points where the normal function of a homologically trivial cycle is constant or, or torsion mod constants? Um, and the second, which, so I'm going to say something about the first. The second, which I can say nothing about, but I thought I'd put it there because the question seems to have arisen. For example, Matt Kerr asked me um, a question similar to this, is the dimension of the torsion locus in Mg minus the hyperelliptic locus bounded? The locus where the normal function of the Teresa cycle is torsion, is it bounded? For example, is the hyperelliptic locus the largest locus in Mg where the uh, normal function of the Teresa cycle is uh, torsion or torsion mod constants? Actually, Dick, uh, can I ask a question before you go on? Yeah. Um, uh, the... Uh, you, you say the locus where a normal function is torsion is an algebraic subvariety. Do, do you mean a countable union of algebraic subvarieties or where the normal function uh, okay, is? Okay, sorry. Yes, I should say all the components. Ah, all, okay. All, Thanks. Right, you, you're right, because another question would be is the locus, is the order of the, I mean, can you have loci where the normal function of the Teresa cycle has arbitrarily large order. So that's another question. And I have no idea what the answer is. So is the order of the torsion of the torsion loci of the Teresa normal function bounded? Maybe I'll add that when I, I'll revise the notes and add that question. Um, all right, so just, just so people don't get too hung up on stacks, and switch off. So we can avoid working with stacks if we impose a level structure. So a level structure on a genus G curve is an isomorphism of the L torsion in the Jacobian with Z mod G to the 2G. You could think of that, yeah. And 
you put the standard symplectic inner product on it. You can do it in your favorite way. And this should be an isomorphism where the V pairing on the left corresponds to the symplectic unimodular symplectic inner product on the right. Okay, so it's it's a finite amount of information. And so if you um, take, if you look at the moduli space of genus G curves, smooth genus G curves with a level L structure, where the level is three or more, it's actually a smooth quasi-projective variety. And so this is, so we'll work on this because I want it, I want it to be clear what it means for a subvariety of mg to be affine. So if we will just do it by fixing a level. And so the finite symplectic group acts on this. It just acts on the isomorphism of the L torsion in the Jacobian with Z mod ah. It should be Z mod LZ. There's a typo there. That um Right, so the, the finite symplectic group acts on this moduli space by acting on this isomorphism, and the quotient is the moduli stack, um, is the moduli stack mg. And so what it really means to work on mg is just to work on mgl spgz mod l equivariantly. It's as simple as that. Should your right-hand side of Jack L uh, L torsion should be C mod L C to the two G. Correct. I just I just noted that. Yeah, I'll fix that typo. Okay. So um, okay. So the first result I have is that if the restriction of the trace a normal function to the closed subvariety X of M G L is torsion mod constants, then X is affine. So let me give you a trivial example. So um, just take X to be a point. So it's clear that the normal function, the restriction of the trace, a normal function to a point is constant. So it's and not, not necessarily torsion, but a point is affine. So that's so this is just to illustrate that we need to consider constants as well as torsion, or we can consider constant. All right, so let me, a more interesting example, but a well-known example is the Teresa normal function vanishes on the hyperelliptic locus and it's well-known the hyperelliptic locus is affine. So that's just a test case. And the converse is not true. You could take a, so as I pointed out, MGL is actually a quasi-projective variety. So stick it in projective space and take a linear subspace of the appropriate dimension so that it, it, it meets MGL in general position and cuts out a curve. And if you take that curve, you can always arrange it so that curve is affine, just in other words, not compact and, uh, and smooth. And, but its fundamental group will subject onto pi one of the moduli space. And that implies many things, but it, among them, it'll imply that uh, the Teresa normal function is not constant on T. All right, so that, if you don't understand the example, don't worry, because it's just to say that you can't reverse the implication in the theorem. Okay, so I need to talk a little bit about the deline mumford compactification of MG, so MG bar, and I'll pretend it, I'll just pretend it's a, um, variety but it has it's it's smooth in the orbifold sense or in the stack sense and the complement of mg in there is a uh, divisor with normal crossings and it has irreducible components delta zero up to delta you know the integer the integer part of g over two and so Again, this is very well known. So the a typical curve in delta zero is obtained by taking a smooth curve of genus G minus one and identifying two points and making the singularity there a node. And a typical point in say delta H where H is positive 
and less than or equal to g over 2 is you take a curve, smooth curve of genus H, a smooth curve of genus G minus H, and you join them uh, transversely at a single point. And you can obtain a compactification, a smooth compactification of MGL just by lifting this up. So this compactification does not have a moduli meaning, but it's it's nice because it's you know has the, the the boundary divisors have more or less the same description. Okay. All right. So and the projection here is ramified over the boundary divisor. Okay, so the Picard group of the moduli space of curves is generated by these divisor classes plus the divisor class of the determinant of the Hodge bundle. So the Hodge bundle over MG has fiber, the holomorphic differentials on C over the moduli point of C. It extends to MG bar and you can take the determinant. So you get a line bundle over MG bar and uh, I'll call it script L and it has a, its divisor class is, or its, its class in the Picard group is lambda. So it's well known that that's the Picard group of MG bar. And you could pull all of these divisor classes back to the compactification of MGL. And it's important to note it's classical and I think due to, essentially due to Bailey, that the line bundle L, the determinant of the Hodge bundle, its restriction to MGL is ample. So it'll embed MGL into projective space. We'll need that later. So the next theorem is the following, and this is where things may get a little um, tough, but there's an a computable effective Q divisor, which I'll call J X bar. Okay, let me just make sure I, I didn't define the notation here. Okay, so X is a subvariety of MGL, moduli space of curves of genus G with a level L structure. Let me just make a note. Um, Okay, so, um, and X bar is a smooth compactification of X. It does not have to be a normal crossing compactification. And um, delta X is X bar minus X. So the theorem says, so you can pull back the Chiresa normal function to X, and now you can look at the divisor and you can also pull back all the divisor classes. So, ah, I must have, yeah, it looks like I left out a slide, sorry. So X bar is mapping to MG bar, X maps to MG, and the pullback of MG inside X bar is X, right? And so X bar minus X is the divisor delta X. And so the, the first assertion is that there's a Q divisor on X bar, which is supported on the boundary. So the boundary is pulled back from the boundary of the compactification, the boundary divisors on of MGL. And the first assertion is this divisor class here um, has non-negative degree on all complete curves T in X bar that are not contained in the pullback of delta zero or where the image of T is contained inside delta zero. So this, you don't have to remember what this looks like, but you should look at the shape. It's some multiple of the determinant of the Hodge bundle minus an effective divisor. Right, so this divisor JX bar is effective and that's gonna be the jumping divisor. And the second thing is, the, this equality holds in pick of X bar tensor Q, if and only if, 
I've got hold twice there. If and only if uh, nu is constant mon torsion on X. Right, so this equality holds in the Picard group of X bar tensored with Q, if and only if nu is constant mod torsion on X. So let me make some remarks. So JX bar is the jumping divisor, and I'm going to define it. It's a non-negative Q linear combination of co-dimension one boundary components of X. So this was proved by Brosnan and Perlstein and Bugos, Holmes and de Jong. And I conjectured some version of this uh, based on a computation I'll show you in a second. And I believe it's actually computable. I haven't tried to do too many cases, but there is a there are two papers to look at, one by Brosnan and Perlstein, and they relate the jumping divisor to some intersection uh, homology groups, local intersection homology groups of the moduli space that I believe are computable. And also there's a paper of de Jong and Chokrai, um, which gives a tropical approach to solving the problem. And I think both of them give you a formula for the jumping divisor. And so the divisor class you'll see a lot of uh, is this divisor M, which is HE plus four lambda minus the sum of boundary components of pick MG or pick MGL, if you like, is called the Morawaki divisor because Morawaki wrote it down. And it seems to play a fundamental role in the Arakelov geometry of MG. And the first statement in the theorem is a strengthened version of Morawaki's inequality where is it telling you that this divisor here has non-negative degree on all complete curves, say, for example, in MG bar, not contained inside delta zero. So again, you don't have to remember the formula for this divisor, but you should sort of look at its shape. It's a multiple of lambda minus a, a, a sum of boundary divisors where all the coefficients are Whoops, there's a typo there. The plus four should be a minus four. It should be minus G zero minus four times that sum. All right. Okay, so let me do an example to show you that there is this divisor JX bar can be non-zero. So let's let HG be the moduli space of hyperliptic curves of genus G, smooth hyperliptic curves. HG bar is its closure inside MG bar, and it's also got it. It's it's a compactification, smooth compactification in the orbifold or stack sense with normal crossings, and it has boundary the delta H as before and. Also, these things called CK. So let me illustrate those. So the restriction of delta zero to the hyperelliptic locus breaks up into components. And the first one, C0, is the obvious one. You take a, G, a hyperelliptic curve of genus G minus one, a pair of points conjugate under the hyperelliptic involution, and you glue those together. And so you also obtain the following things. You can take a smooth cur hyperelliptic curve of genus K and one of G minus K minus one. And on each of them, you choose a hyperelliptic conjugate pair of points. And then you glue these two curves together along that pair of hyperelliptic conjugate points. And you'll see you get a curve with an involution. And um, as before, we get, yeah, so here the Picard group of HG bar is generated by the divisor classes of these boundary divisors. And you may say, what happened to lambda? You should think of it this way. The hyperelliptic locus is affine. And so lambda has to be, uh, and lambda's ample, so lambda has to be a linear combination of boundary components. In fact, we'll see the formula in a minute. 
Okay, so if we restrict from pick of mg bar to pick of hg bar, it takes delta zero to c zero plus two times the sum of the ck where k is positive. And it takes delta h to delta h when h is positive. So the so we know that the Teresa normal function is identically zero on hg. So the second theorem I stated plus Cornalba and Harris imply that we have the following. So the theorem says that the Morawaki divisor minus the jumping divisor vanishes. And Cornelva and Harris say that this guy on the right vanishes. And if you plug in the top line and just do a little algebra, you see that you can solve for J of H bar. It's this guy down here. So, uh, and you see that it's an effective divisor, in this case, with integer coefficients. So I'm going to work my way through the ideas in the second theorem, and then I'll sketch the proof of the first theorem. And so somehow this jumping divisor, uh, for me, I believe it's a fundamental but mysterious thing. So to understand where all this stuff's coming from and to understand the jumping divisor, we have to introduce by extensions. So if V is a Hodge structure of weight minus one, we know that J of V is really just the extensions of Z by V. So if you like, they're mixed Hodge structures with weight graded quotients isomorphic to Z and V. I say a fixed isomorphism. Sorry, may I ask a question before we get into by extensions? Yes. So do, do we only understand the restriction of the, the pullback of the jumping divisor to like AG bar or are there other low size where we know something? Uh, sorry. Um, do we, What was the question? Do we so understand? You, the... you, you, you said like we understand what um, if we pull back the jumping divisor to the closure of the hyperliptic locus, we, we know what it is or like you wrote down. It, a form it's, it's, it's not a universal divisor for every map into so basically for every well if you have just some smooth x nothing to do with the Teresa cycle and you have your normal function over it and some mm -hmm. smooth compactification you will get a jumping divisor uh -huh. and so and if you restrict if you have for example a curve in there if the curve passes through the the co-dimension one components of the boundary at smooth points transversely the everything will just restrict nicely but if you if that curve passes through some higher co-dimensional component or some singularities of the boundary, then you'll get a jumping divisor. But to explain what it is, I need to explain by extensions. Okay, all right, thanks. So, um, so the dual torus of J of V, so the dual torus is just pick zero of J of V, is really x1 of v, z of one. So v has weight minus one, z of one has weight minus two. And if, if v has weight minus one, a polarization on it is some amorphism of Hodge structures that satisfies certain properties. The Riemann-Hodge bilinear relations is a map from v tensor v into z of one. So this you can see gives you a map from j of v into j of v dual. Because J of V dual is X one of V Z of one. So it just takes an extension to hom of the extension into Z of one. Again, don't just imagine J of V and J of V dual are the same. They're isogenous. And in the case of H one of a curve, this is an isomorphism. Okay, so, oops. So um, what's a by extension? They're going to be mixed hot structures with three weight graded quotients, Z, V, and Z of one. So um, you'll have a map from the set of by extensions into the product of 
J of V and J of V dual, or if you like, just by, if you have a by extension, you can mod out by the Z of one and you get an extension of Z by V, or you can just restrict to the weight minus one part and you get an extension of V by Z of one. So you get a map into the product of J of V and it's dual. In fact, it's some kind of Poincaré bundle. And in fact, the fiber over any point in the base is just an ex a torsor under X1 of Z by Z of one. You can twist any by extension by an extension of Z by Z of one. And that, if you use the formula that I wrote down earlier, that's just C, C star or C cross. Okay, so now let me just give you a simple example. I'm not going to go anywhere with this, but to give you an idea what's going on, if you take four distinct points on a curve B, you can look at H1 of C minus a, one pair relative to the other pair. And if you look at what's the project, this is a by extension. If you project it to um, X1Z by H, it's just H1 of C relative to this pair. And if you just take the weight minus one part, it's H1 of C minus that pair of points. But by duality, this is the same as HOM of H1 of C relative to PQ into Z of one. So that's an example of a by extension. And in a little while, I'm going to define the height of a by extension. And in this case, the height of this by extension is the Archimedean part of the height pairing between P minus Q and R minus S. Okay, so, but you can forget that example. I just did it to make show you that there's something concrete going on here underneath. Okay, so um, we have a C star bundle, these by extensions mapping to the intermediate Jacobian and its dual. And it has a met canonical metric, and this is really important. And so how do we get that? We take BR of V. So these are real uh, by extensions. So these are mixed Hodge structures with weight graded quotients R, VR, and R of one. And because there are no extensions between real Hodge structures of say weight zero and minus one, the JV and its dual just vanish. And so, the space of real by extensions is just X1 of R by R of one, and that is just isomorphic to the real numbers. So you get a map, a uh, bad name for it, I called it new, which is our name for a normal function. Anyway, so we get this um, function here from real by extensions into R, it's an isomorphism, so it's giving us a map from all by extensions, integral by extensions into R, and we can define the height of a by extension to be, or uh, the exponential of this number. So it's something in R cross. And um, we have a, just like we, with intermediate Jacobians, we have a relative version. So we have a, if you have a family of, um, a variation of hot structure it should, I should say weight minus one over X we have um, a by extension bundle over the product of the two families of intermediate Jacobians so if you restrict to the fiber over X it would just be the bundle I the C star bundle I wrote down on the previous page and it's a naturally metrized line bundle. It's an absolutely canonical metric. And if you have, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to map the Jacobian, the family of Jacobians into J of V cross J of V dual by using the identity on the first factor and the polarization on the second factor. And so we pull it back and we're going to get a metrized C star bundle over the Jaco intermediate Jacobian bundle. And I don't want to work with C star bundles. I want to work with line bundles. So I'm going to call it script B of V. So I fill in the zero section. 
And you know where the zero section is because the metric has to go to zero on the... In the C star bundle, if you go one way, the metric goes to infinity. If you go the other way, the metric goes to zero. So that tells you where to put the zero section. Anyway, so if you have a normal function, you can pull back this metrized line bundle along the normal function and you obtain a by extension bundle over the base. It depends on the normal function and maybe I should have put b sub x comma nu, but uh, I didn't. So this is arising from a normal function. So a long time ago, I had a student, Dale Lear, who unfortunately left mathematics, but he wrote a very nice thesis in 1990, and he showed that a positive power of the by extension bundle over x extends to a holomorphic line bundle over x bar. So you, for some technical reason, you have to take a power of it to get... Um, it to extend and it has the it's def, it's characterized by the property that the metric extends continuously to uh x that should say that should say uh x bar minus delta x singular i'll fix that up um all right but it extends to a continuous metric away from the singular locus of the boundary. And so to give it some meaning, if nu was an admissible normal function, meaning it corresponds to some admissible variation of mixed Hodge structure, then sections of this bundle correspond to admissible by extensions, whose, whose short weight graded quotients correspond to the normal function and its dual. Okay, so another important thing here is there's a two-form on this bundle of intermediate Jacobians. It's translation invariant, meaning it's... Yeah, so this bundle of Jacobians actually is a real bundle of tori is actually flat, meaning it's locally constant. So if you have an invariant form on any fiber, you can parallel transport it around. And there's a, there's a unique two form on the total space of the bundle of intermediate Jacobians um, that corresponds to the polarization. I believe some people call this the Betty form. All right. So yeah, it's locally constant with respect to this isomorphism. And so the curvature of this, the by extension metric is twice the pullback of this form. So it's worth thinking about this. If you have a normal function, which is constant, it's lying in a leaf of this local, you know, VR mod VZ, this form will vanish on it. And so the, if you have a constant section, this form vanishes, the pullback of it to the base. But in general, it's a semi-positive 1-1 one, one form on the base that extends to a locally L1 form or current, if you like, on X bar minus some set that's contained in the singular locus of the boundary. And it vanishes if and only if the normal function is constant. So the key take home message here is that the by extension metric, the curvature of the by extension bundle vanishes if and only if the normal function is constant. Maybe I should, uh, yeah, I should say locally constant. Okay, meaning it could be torsion mod constants. Okay, so now let's take x to be mg and x bar to be mg bar. So years ago with David Reed, we prove that the by extension line bundle of associated to the normal function of the Teresa cycle is the Morawaki line bundle. So the first churn class of this line bundle is the Morawaki divisor.
And so somehow this, this thing sort of baked into st the study of the Teresa cycle. So let me just step aside for a second. This theorem is actually not hard, but it you can prove that Just uh, noticed enough. I should say is yeah. So the normal function is constant if and only if the by extension is trivial as a metrized ah, as a holomorphic line bundle, and that's equivalent to saying it's uh, trivial as a metrized line bundle. And so this is telling you that some class is constant some multiple of nu is constant if and only if some tensor power of the by extension line bundle is trivial, both as a metrized line bundle and just as a holomorphic line bundle. So this establishes the second part of the second theorem. Anyway, for this to be useful, we need to be able to compute the churn class of this by extension bundle, where x yeah, in general, and for maps of X into MG. So this is where height jumping comes in. So you might think that the by extension bundle behaves well with respect to pullback, but it doesn't. So here we have some... So here, I forgot to say V has weight minus one. It should be clear. So we have a polarized variation of Hodge structure over Y of weight minus one and a normal function. And we have two by extension bundles. We have the by extension bundle over Y, the by extension bundle over X, and the pullback of B of Y to X is B of X. But the pullback of the extended the Lear extensions, if you like, of these by extension bundles are not the pullback of the Lear extension of the by extension bundle over Y bar is not the by extension bundle, the extended by extension bundle over X bar. They differ by a twist by a boundary divisor. And this, so the boundary divide, this twist is by a divisor J of X bar over Y bar which is supported on the boundary of X, I guess. Yeah. I got a few. Okay. But anyway, it's supported on the boundary. So the following result here is that the jumping divisor is effective. So it's a non-negative linear combination of boundary devices of X here. And so this gives the strength and Morawaki inequality, knowing that the jumping divisor, if you feed that into theorem, the second theorem, you get the strength and Morawaki divisor using the positivity of the curvature of the by extension line bundle and the fact that the jumping divisor is effective. So um, this just says that the Morawaki divisor has non-negative degree on all curves in MG bar that do not lie in delta zero. Okay, so why height jumping? So I, I've only got a few minutes left. So I'll say this very briefly, but here's a toy model of what the metric looks like in two variables. You don't get height jumping in one variable. But if you have two variables, you do. And you, this example easily generalizes to any number of variables. So we know that the by extension bundle extends across co-dimension, the smooth locus of co-dimension one. So um, as a metrized line bundle. So we'll get a metrized we have a trivial line bundle. The by extended by extension line bundle is a line bundle necessarily trivial over the poly disk D squared. The metric extends continuously everywhere away from the origin. And 
when there's height jumping, the metric looks something like this. So our trivializing section will be sigma and it's um, the log of it. Oh, uh, it's better to talk about its logarithm will be will, will look something like this expression on the right, the product of these two logarithms divided by their sum. And you can easily check, that's what the calculation down here does, is that this metric is continuous everywhere if you cross one of the boundary divisors, d cross zero or zero cross d, the metric extends continuously, but actually not smoothly, okay? But something weird happens as you approach zero, for example, along a curve given by the formula t goes to t to the n1, t to the n2. The log of the length of that section looks like this rational multiple of log t. And if, you, if you're on this curve t and you want to get the, if you want to extend the line bundle so that the metric is continuous, you have to take a different trivializing section. And so the trivializing section you would need to take is the trivializing section on the whole polydisc divided by t, you know, this power of t, which is a rational power of t. So this is why we have to take a power of the by extension line bundle to extend the metric. And so here the jumping divisor would be uh, n1, n2 divided by the sum of the two n's. And this is the jumping divisor on the holomorphic arc D. So I want to make, I'm almost done. In the normal crossing case, the boundary behavior at a boundary point, the, the boundary behavior of the by extension and its metric is controlled by a local monodromy representation from pi one of the polydisc into the symplectic group uh, of V, semi-direct product V. And I don't know what mean means, but I this is the best I could do here. So the idea here is in complex analysis, if you have a rational function and you take its logarithm, the monodromy is how that changes as you go around, say, the origin is related to how log of f grows as you go towards zero. So going a monodromy going around something and growth of some section as you go towards that something are closely related. It's the same thing here. So there's a, a re representation that in, uh, controls the jumping divisor. So um, I was going to sketch the proof of the first theorem. It's not hard. It's the, just the simple idea is if the normal function vanishes, then a, um, right, then the ample line bundle, determinant of Hodge bundle is equivalent to an effective sum of boundary divisors. So it's telling you an ample divisor is supported on the boundary. And so that implies the result, the affine result. Okay, so I'm going to finish this because this is everything I've talked about is geometry, but I'm wondering if there's an arithmetic version of any of these theorems here. So the appropriate thing would be to look at, to start with a curve over a number field, take the appropriate kind of model over of that curve over a ring of integers in the number field. You can define an arithmetic Morawaki divisor on uh, in the in the Arakelov Picard group of MG. Maybe I should have put MG bar. And we can define a Morawaki divisor, an arithmetic Morawaki divisor um, of uh, this arithmetic curve and we get a jumping divisor. You can use the local Galois representations here. So there'll be the, 
this curve script Z, C will have bad reduction only at a finite number of primes. And at those primes, you will get a, a, a Galois representation here. Um, and that should determine a, an element of the uh, field, say, KP, the local field. And uh, with some optimism, all of those numbers should come from a single rational number and we can assume everything's integral so we could multiply well we could just clear denominators by taking powers of this arithmetic line bundle and then the question is is the class of the Chiracer cycle in the Chow group of C as a curve over K trivial mod translations if and only if the moral the Morawaki divisor equals the jumping divisor. So that would be the analog of the second theorem. And I'll stop there. Ah, and I'll show you. There are, I, I put references at the end here in case you want to count them down. Geometry there. Can, oh, can so, I ask? Um, this is a great oh, time for sorry. questions. Right. Yeah, go can, ahead. Can, I want to ask why, uh, if you know the order of the of the torsion of the Teresa's uh, normal function uh, is k, uh, why does the the power in the line bundle to make it a holomorphic line bundle has to be k squared? And your second theorem. I don't. Um, maybe you can use a smaller power, but basically. Um, the by extension is sort of quadratic in the normal function. So, uh, see if you, yeah, the by extension of k times nu is uh, the by extension of nu uh, to the k k squared power. I don't know if that helps, but I guess here, if you had K torsion, instead of multiplying, um, so so we'd embedded, let's go back here. Yeah, so when we embed, why did I do that? Uh, looking for it. Anyway, when we embed, yeah, here it is. The the J of V is being mapped to J of V cross J of V dual. I guess when we do this, where if I multiply nu by k, it's going to map. I'm going to get. I'm going to replace both factors by uh, the multiple k. So I'm going to get k squared. I guess. If you had a k torsion normal function, you could just multiply one factor by k, and that would raise the by extension bundle to the kth power. And maybe that's a smarter thing to do. So, Does that answer the can I ask a question real quick? Yeah. Well, so just to your last slide, the arithmetic slide. Um, I do want to say that I would love it if something like this could work, but I also am somehow, I mean, this condition that your script P doesn't divide script L, I just worry that you don't have enough information. Like, I mean, I would like, I would love it if something like this worked, but I somehow feel like, because I'm sort of afraid to do piatic Hodge theory, but I somehow feel like for things like this, I've come to feel that you need that information that comes from thinking of the representations with p adic coefficients at a local field with residue characteristic p. Okay. But I, I could I, be wrong, but that's, I mean. So, okay. So here's caveat. So I really know, I don't really have the technical background to do that. You know, I sort of learned something about yeah, me the either. card group. So whether I thought, well, it's safer to use L than P. <laughs> um, but 
I'm open to suggestions. I mean, I'm just putting this out there. And, and the point I'm trying to make is it's become clear that in the geometric case, the jumping divisor plays a role. And I mean, I, I hope to have this written up within a few months, you know, sort of half written up now. So, um, so the question is, should there be an arithmetic jumping divisor? And if so, how do you define it and what role should it play? And uh, I'm perfectly open to people suggesting better ways to define the arithmetic jumping divisor. Well, it would, it would have a component at infinity, I guess, right? And you could probably say a lot about it. Okay, so component at infinity. So like here's the primes. So here's something you can do, and here's the way to test this out. So I realized. Um, that one can so you need to write down an arithmetic line bundle so it's going to be the relative dualizing i guess i'm speaking without great authority here it should be the relative dualizing sheaf of script c and so it'll have an archimedean part and so the question is what's the metric so you have to use the by extension metric so you have to take the usual metric on in this case it'll be h1 you know the holomorphic differentials on the curve you know or, or the determinant of that and you'll need to multiply it by some version of this beta of associated with the curve this function that david reed and i wrote down so and i always thought it was hopeless you couldn't write down this function but you can over the hyperelliptic locus it's the gth power of the discriminant of the binary form of degree 2g plus 2 associated to the hyperelliptic curve. I just, with some help from uh, Vonda here, I, I, I figured this out. So it's, it's, you can explicitly write down the metric on the line bundle. So one could presumably test this out. You could take the hyperelliptic curve, try to figure out what you want the jumping divisor to be, we know that it's trivial, so, and, and you can compute the Morawaki divisor there just by, I assume, by how, you know, the reduction type of the curve mod P for the various P's. Does that make sense? May I ask like a related, maybe follow-up question? So uh, just to make sure I'm understanding, um, uh, okay, two, maybe two questions. Um, so this representation that you have on the slide is maybe coming from the Galva action on, on the fundamental group mod L3 or something. You've just uh, taken the abelian bet and you've split it some way. Yeah. Um, I mean... um, so so you, you're talking about metrizing uh, bundles coming from, um, from coming from taking the dualizing sheaf and... and um, and like you know, um, well, okay, your by by extension, okay, so okay, maybe second related question. Your by extension metric came from taking like the translation invariant metric on this intermediate Jacobian. Uh, is there is there some kind of uh, universal metric on on the family of pi ones or something? Is there some non-abelian version of uh, of a universal metric? Or where you don't just look at where you don't just look at the family of uh, things constructed from um, homology, but you actually you keep track of the family of pi ones. Is 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 there some definition there to work with? Um, yeah, so, yeah. So somehow, okay. So somehow it's coming for me. You know, I make a. I'm an, essentially a topologist, so I make a living out of using the Torelli group, <laughs> and so. So the mapping class, pi one of the moduli space of curves is, is the mapping class group, say, a surface. And it maps to the symplectic group. In fact, it maps onto the in integral symplectic group. The kernel is the Torelli group. And the Torelli group has a quotient, which is the Heisenberg group of... Uh, so it, it's first it has its abelianization, which is essentially the primitive part of H3 of... Uh, the Jacobian of the curve, but 
Um, so you'll get a map that'll give you a map from the mapping class group into the symplectic group, semi-direct product with V. And you can view that as pi one of the universal intermediate Jacobian over AG. But then you've got this by extension line bundle over that. And it'll be, it has on each fiber, it has pi one fundamental group that's the Heisenberg group associated to the primitive intermediate Jacobian um, and its polarization. I don't know if this helps. So what happens is, yeah, I mean, there's a tricky thing going on here, we, um, but the mapping class group maps to the semi-direct product of the symplectic group and the primitive part of H3 of the intermediate Jacobian. And that is pi one of the bundle of intermediate Jacobians. It doesn't map to the semi-direct product of the symplectic group and the Heisenberg group. But locally, you can do that. And, they, and that gives you some local representations. You have to somehow change some things around. And that homomorphism is what determines the local behavior of the height of the Chiresa normal function. I don't know if that helps. But okay, as for so metric on pi one, I, I, I tend to think of it as a metric on this line bundle over the bundle of intermediate Jacobians. Over AG. It's not like a bundle that's defined on MG. Like or there isn't a way okay. Yeah, you can you can do, you know, AG is the moduli space of hot structures of weight minus one. The Intermediate Jacobian over it's the moduli space of, you know, extensions of Z by, you know, the third exterior power divided by, of H divided by H. And then you also have the by extension bundle over that. They're all defined over AG. And the period map maps MG to AG. The normal function of the Teresa cycle lifts it to the bundle of intermediate Jacobians. It does not lift to the by extension line bundle there and the obstruction is you have to twist that line bundle by the determinant of the Hodge bundle to the HE plus fourth power. That's why this HE plus four lambda comes in everywhere. And so there's group theory involved in this and there's um, yeah I mean I I need to think about how to explain it better, but there's, um, and I, frankly, I have to, I just started, I kind of understood what Brosnan and Perlstein and also Bulgas, uh, Holmes and, and de Jong did, but, you know, I need to understand much better how they're looking at this height jumping to have a good opinion on how to compute this thing in the arithmetic case. But I suspect you can just do it using local intersection homology. Uh, 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 now I've said that, now I have doubts, but you know, in the arithmetic setting. All right, well, let's thank uh, Richard Hayne again. Oh. And our next talk will be October 15th by Valia Gazaki.